Lieutenant Commander Argyle says Mr. Kaczynski's methods are meaningless. A targ is on the bridge, and space and time and thought aren't the separate things they appear to be. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton and Denise Crosby. Hello, hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Tejas. Today we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation, Season 1, Episode 5, Where No One Has Gone Before, written by Diane Duane and Michael Reeves, more on him in a moment, directed by Rob Bowman. This was October 26th, 1987. Where were you? Of course, this entire first season is sponsored by Tim Baum, aka Grandpa One. Thank you to him. Go team. How are you guys doing? Really nice. good. Good. Friday. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I said go team because I couldn't remember what Tim Baum's favorite team is, but you know he's always freaking out about it. So just go that team. It's yeah. Liverpool. Football. Something I think like so. That. Football. Anyway, Football. Um, boy, oh boy, this one was uh, every one of these so far is different than I remember them. And some I I barely remember at all. And for me personally, I was like, whoa, I don't remember this episode getting so exciting in the middle. Like, And I, I love the music scoring. I was just kind of like, it felt more, I felt more emotionally invested, like, you know, the, the highs and lows of emotions in this episode. But I don't know, what did you guys think of this one? Well, you know, before I watched it, I had absolutely no recollection of this mm -hmm. episode whatsoever. I, I, when you had mentioned, um, you know, Eric, um, being part of it, I went, oh, okay, well, that's the one that he's in, mm -hmm. but I couldn't remember what he, I remembered what he looked like, but I couldn't remember what he did. Um, and I, so while watching it, I, I started to piece it together again. I mean, I don't have a lot in this episode. Mm -hmm. This is where it begins to, you, you know. You finally got a little bit of time off. <laughs> you were heavily well, focused you would, on. You would think, you would think, but I'm still there on that bridge, you know, yeah. so I'm, I'm still there. But um, it was, you know, when I was watching it, I... I really, I really loved the the heart that that the character of the traveler, you know, brings to this um, mm -hmm. onto this bridge, and his his thoughtfulness and his compassion and uh, for humanity, you know, in a really a, a beautifully deep way. He really, mm -hmm. it was, it was, he did a beautiful job in it. Yeah, and by the way, everybody forgot to mention at the top. The Traveler himself, <laughs> legendary actor Eric Menyuk, will be joining us in just a few in the second segment here. So stay tuned for that. Can't wait to talk with him. Uh, sorry, Sirach, what were you going to say? I was going to say that, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed this episode. I thought it was um, it was fun, interesting. There was a level of curiosity there about what was going on, um, you know, there was a point there where you're trying to guess. You're trying to guess in front of the story. At least I was. So <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking, okay, so what's going to happen? Who's the villain? Who's the, you know, what is this about? And it did have some several unexpected twists that I didn't, you know, I couldn't really foresee while I was watching it. So I enjoyed that part of it. That's true. There um, was no villain, now that you mention it. There was, uh, yeah. the well, antagonist I, was just that. Kaczynski, that Kaczynski was kind of, yeah. yeah. I, I, kept you know at one point i was going why is this guy why are, why isn't he in the you know arrested on the show right <laughs> totally now? i mean the guy yeah. is a is a total you know villain i mean he's he's he, he's bs his way in his plus his his attitude and his arrogance and he really yeah. doesn't know i mean he has messed up badly and he's a maniac like he looked he's i, I mean maniac. they cast they cast him perfectly the second you see him you're like that dude's insane Oh God! You know, just the, his his the, his body language, everything about him. But but I mean, logically, I'm thinking, why is this guy walking around? So why is he even allowed to speak? Mm -hmm. Of course, they need him. It's redeemed when when the traveler says, "I need you." He goes, "Oh, you need me." You know, it's like I, I 
okay yeah. i guess that that satisfies that but you know i still i would have i would have arrested that guy put him away and if if the traveler needs him at the end to sit there on the console bring him out in chains bring him out just for that yeah cuz it was yeah. like this guy, I, I don't i don't i don't get that mm. part of the logic yeah that that was you know there's sometimes when you just have to suspend certain things. Um, <laughs> and I had to suspend a few things in order for me to continue on with the storyline. That was one of the biggest ones. You know, right away I started, I was noticing like, why doesn't he have a comm badge on? So, you know, he's walking around Good and point. he has no, no insignia on him. So I'm thinking. No bling. That, yeah, that's like a police officer without a badge. So, you know, <laughs> totally. I don't really. Yeah let me see your credentials, you know, like, who are yeah. you? Where are you, you know, I, I don't really know that he has credentials. Um, so that was my, fir- that was the first thing that caught my eye was like, where's this dude Starfleet, you know, combat. Right. right. And this is, this is by, this is dictated by Starfleet that this right. guy is coming on and to check the warp speed and do, which tests. is also weird, which is weird. Right. They, they don't, they don't know that this is a big scan and they, and they, and he's got this alien Free. I mean, th- this alien's been doing it on these other ships. The same mm-hmm. thing's been going on. And He's Riker's there and fading in and out. Yeah, and we've got Riker yeah. is on to him from the very beginning. Riker knows from the very beginning yeah. this guy's full. So how come Starfleet, you right? know, and their infinite wisdom isn't keeping an eye on him or saying or or there aren't reports from previous ships? I forgot uh, the the Fearless yeah. and the Ajax, yeah. obviously exactly. fearful because. They didn't mm-hmm. want to say anything, but like, and, and the first thing when he starts talking all of his talk, thank goodness they said what they did. Cause I was like, I don't know what the, this guy's talking about. And they're like, it sounds meaningless. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> else notices right. it. I have no idea what this guy is saying. Yeah. I, I mean, it took, it took me a, a, a <laughs> I kept thinking of my my husband when he sits and w- the few times he's watched these with me. I look at him and I go, "Do you understand anything that just happened?" He, he never. He never understands a word of these shows. I thought you were going to say that he talks in that same like where he's like, "Oh, you got to fix the power converter on your." And you're like, are "I you don't know." Kidding me? He that he is like the least likely human being. <laughs> um, uh, even improvise in this, time. although. He's pretty good at at parodying it all, but um, yeah, he just he he would watch this show. There's no way he would understand what's what what the hell that just happened. <laughs> I, I mean, I was having yeah. trouble. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the, that's where you know when the alien guy comes in, and this is a species that no one has seen before. Apparently, mm-hmm. I, I felt that the level of curiosity wasn't high enough. You know, what is you know who. What is the species? What are your how you know, gifts or talents C. or abilities? Tau Alpha yeah, C. You're... That's all we got. Right. No idea what and that you're means. gonna sit and you're gonna sit at this console. Right. And I, start right, messing I, with right. our stuff. Right. I don't know what your history is, your backstory. You know, like if you meet a Borg, <laughs> you know, out of nowhere, you know, it would probably be smart not to just like invite them in. And, you know, you'd right. be curious to know some backstory like, OK, where are you from? What, you know, what's your goal here? And I felt like that was just really brushed over right away. Like, oh, he's with me. Yeah. So you yeah. know, on to the next. Yeah. And, and the curiosity should have been like, whoa, 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 he's with you. Yeah. But I've never seen this guy before. Like, is he a, is he a telepath? Is he you know, does he have certain, you know, we need some information. Right. Uh, and there wasn't um, the curiosity wasn't high enough for me for something. You know, you see, you haven't seen it before. You, you'd be curious. Um, and the other side of curiosity that I thought was um, not played well, was downplayed, was when they were on the edges of the universe and when they were in, you know, places that nobody's ever seen before. Uh, Picard kept saying, well, damn it, we don't know who we're going to report to. And, you know, the, you know, you know. Why why do a study when, you know, we don't even, who are we going to report it to? Right. And my thing is, yeah, yeah, that's true. But the ship has the capability to scan surfaces of planets and stuff like that from a distance, from the comfort of your own, you know. So while you're trying to figure out how you're going to get back, I would also be doing 
scans and, and, and connecting as much uh, data as I can of the edges of the universe, you know, like, wow, nobody's ever seen this. Like, what is this? Um, so that's right. another level of curiosity that I felt like, wh- where's the excitement about that? You guys are the, you know, like 10 a billion light years away. That should be in itself like, whoa, this is amazing. We're the first people, we're, we're the first yeah. seeing this. Yeah. First experiencing. They would right. reference it, you know, there were two like very kind of just non-energetic, you know, suggestions of it made. One by Data, right. you know, one by um, Kaczynski, you know, this could be a science experiment. And, you know, but then right. moved, moved, moved off. I also, you know, when thinking back, when we, when, when they first come aboard and they start doing, running these, you know, diagnostic tests or something or whatever they're doing here, the warp tests, the, and Wesley, you know, is asked to leave, but he's hovering and he's looking and he just jumps in and starts, you know, pressing buttons like, but, but they're running like tests. So it's like, what, I'm not sure you would, you would just touch anything at this point. Even if you see something going on, you could suggest, but I mean, I, there's no way he's going to start to, even though it ends up once again, you know, Wesley is, um, Wesley should be running the ship at this point. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of the, just, the running gag yeah, too, where they're like, yes. after after like the first episode when I was like, hey, why are they letting? And now I'm just like, all right, so this is a universe in which uh, they let some 16 year old yeah. boy genius. They're like, whatever. And then I will say though, the one time I kind of switched on that was when the traveler told Picard, he's a special kid. You really need to, you know, help without interfering, and this and that. So at least that to me explained the change there. It didn't explain beforehand, but it explains to me, okay, that's cool that now Picard is being told like, hey, this is a very special kid and you really need to keep your eye on him and encourage him and allow him to grow. So that was, that worked for me and that was cute. I liked it. Yeah. I'm I'm glad that they finally, you know, cause I mean, it, clearly we're seeing it as an audience. Mm-hmm. The kid is solving every problem, every engineering skill, you know, <laughs> I mean, he's fixing everything and, you know, being treated, dismissed left and right by everyone scolded. I mean, you know, I'm the whole, the whole being called the, the boy. boy, get the boy, get the boy, you know, it's like, okay, we, you know, let, let's, we got to do, I'm curious what comes after this now. Is this a shift now? Hmm. That yeah. we're see? This because is, this, I, I think they went, they've gone way too hard on the Wesley story, boy yeah. genius. Um, in the beginning of the show, I'm not, it's not my favorite theme and I think they're overdoing it. It's fine that it's there. But I just feel like they're just hitting it over the head, over the head, over and again, over and again. I just got to hear about how smart he is. And you might as well make this the Doogie Hauser of Star Trek and just make mm-hmm. him like the surgeon. You know what I mean? The, he's he's the doctor. He's the engineer. He's the he's the yeah. captain, mm-hmm. you know, and that bothers me. Another thing that I was like, so wait a minute, these guys are doing a whole you know, pseudoscience, a fake diagnostic on the warp drive. And Wesley knows about it. It's like, how, how would he know about something that's completely fictitious? That's, that is not even, <laughs> that is not right. based in the legitimate science. So how could you know about it then? Well, wait was- a minute, walk me, let's, let's like walk me through this. Like I'm the deli butcher, you know, <laughs> like, okay, not, not, so the premise is that they're going to run some tests on the warp speed. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we know Kaczynski's full of, you know, he, this is not real. But right? Kaczynski doesn't know that he's full of shit, which is the crazy part. He like we all he, know, but even he, Deanna Troy says he's, he he's believes very what confident. He's saying. So he's yeah. not even trying to swindle so them. He thinks, he's just he thinks, an idiot. So he just thinks all of his little analysis and data, even though it's been run through by by uh, right engineers, does it? Yeah. The engineer um, Argyle, which Argyle, yeah. <laughs> Argyle, they, Argyle, they right? Yeah, no, nothing so on the nail on the head. But anyway, yeah. um, 
So Argyle and and, and Riker, um, you know, go. This is just not we. Nothing changed. Nothing were you know. Nothing happened. So what is the what are we looking at for? What is the traveler supposed to be doing? Right. Like what is, so you've got Kaczynski's the got assistant. the formula, the data. He's in Starfleet. Mm-hmm. Right. So what is who is this guy? What he what is he? bringing to the table and we we don't this is a surprise to us Mm -hmm. well they said that he that that is his assistant so presumably while this guy's entering in whatever the assistant is handling the side stuff or checking the data to make sure or what you know whatever an assistant will be doing at that time what is this thing we've never seen it you're you you know you're in starfleet what why do you have the who where'd you get this guy or this Probably thing. because he's been pre-approved from the previous ships, right? I mean, like if they they were a they they were probably already told ahead of time that it's this guy and his assistant are coming onto the ship, right? It had to have been, yeah. Um, unless he's working for Section Thirty One and he's got his Uh-oh. own like top secret <laughs> mission that he's on. But yeah, I, I so that's the problem I have. If Kaczynski is doing a fake method that doesn't do anything really, it's not actually improving the warp drive capability right then then the alien guy is doing something whatever he's doing he's doing something that right is foreign to the other guy but it's something foreign to all of us he's doing something in the computer system whether he's merging with it in his own entity and the abilities he has or he's programming something into it he's doing something right my my question is if this alien is doing something so abstract, nobody knows how to do this, which is, you know, exceeds the logic of physics with the, sp- the speed of warp. Right. How could how could Wesley know about it? How could he understand that level of science? Because if he's he a genius that knows they're, everything. They're, they're, right. They're, they're, right. They're, they're, but yes. Exactly. That's that he, he was helping him as if he knows the thing too. True. You know what's he, funny about this? This is he you was guys correcting it. He was correcting right. it. That's that's the, he was. knows the formula that's that will take you past the speed of warp. So it's like, well, it like he became Einstein, you know, without living without knowing the sciences that lead up yeah. to it. It just the guy's yeah. an alien from a different time zone, from a place and time that right. we have no answer. That we haven't even so, gotten there yet. Right. So how do you know his knowledge? That's what I'm saying. How could you understand Absolutely. that knowledge? That's all I'm saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, math and science are universal. So if it's going to be <laughs> mathematic or, or science related, then theoretically, I, I don't know, that, that doesn't bother me so much. You guys are going through what I went through on my first run through, where I was just like... <laughs> Why, like, even when I was a kid, I think the kid is supposed to appeal to the kids. But when I was a kid, the the, the children characters never appealed to me. I was never like, oh, wow, I want to be the next whatever. I was just like, I, I don't care about this. I want to see the big people do the big people stuff. But now that I've already, that's like 30 years ago that I went through that yeah. or whatever. Now I'm like, all right, it doesn't, it actually doesn't bother me as much because I know what to expect. But watching you guys go through what I went through, which is like, how does this kid know everything? How to and the and the writers are probably thinking, he he just does, he just does. But we're like, yeah, but well, but yeah. I want well, more. Tell than them just that. he's a genius and they'll that that's all the explanation that's needed. Mm-hmm. He's a yeah. special genius. Comparing yeah. him to Mozart, you know. Um yeah. that and the traveler, yeah. right, comparing him to Mozart, that was a really good uh, point there. Well, and, I would I would have liked him. a little backstory in that, too. I would have liked some kind of, like, one of our kind of people helped Mozart become Mozart. Like, so we've always been That's there interesting. for the nurturing of these special uh, lives, whatever they are, right? Whoever they are throughout time. We come mm-hmm. there and we get, we're there. So a little backstory on that. I, um, the thing is, I'm getting too much story on Wesley's life and and his desires and passions of life. I have very little background on Jordy. I have very little background on Worf. Um, I have, uh, you know, I'm getting a little bit of data. Riker, wh- where are their backstories to give me more insight into their perspective and their life stories and what they've gone through to get to this place? 
I feel like uh, we've been hitting the same uh, tones and those same points over and over again on the show so far. Like with the gang rape situation with your character, mm. how many times are they going to bring up the gang rape stuff? Like, like again, I was thinking like seriously, like how does a kitten, you seeing a kitten turn into the gang rape thing again? I know. And, and I was thinking until I, until I remembered the guy that was fighting the flames in the, in the corridor, but everybody's memory or their thought that they projected, whether it was the Targ, the Klingon Targ, that's a, that's a, that's a warm, loving memory thought. You've got the ballerina, the woman doing pirouettes become, you know, beautiful, the guy playing the in violin. The violin in the, in the playing, a, I believe it was Mozart they were playing. And, um, and of course, and Tasha. And Picard was, had his mom. His mom. And he was talk- that was a he beautiful was scene. Beautiful. Was a beautiful, scene. Yeah. beautiful. He had, you know, true emotion there. And you've got Tasha with the, with the rape gangs. <laughs> In this outfit, yeah, like, uh, like I'm going to the 70s disco with did you notice the scratches across the chest? Yes, yeah. yep, I did. And I and did. like I like she's that's what she's wearing. She's been yeah. an orphan since she was five. Yeah, I I I, mean, I, I, I was like, guys, don't blatant. beat that. Yeah, that's you're, it's borderline sexual harassment from what from your yeah. angle, literally. Yeah. Um, from your character's angle, because it's like, wait, you can't keep bringing this one thing up. There has to be more depth, more more to the stories. It's constant sexualization, yeah, um, yeah. and um, you know, ideation of this 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 um, this character. Anytime they can, they can do it. But Anytime. I have to say, I enjoyed the the episode though. Ultimately, because I did think it brought in, I thought it was paced well. I kind of liked the graphics of the, I know mm-hmm. it was back in the day graphics of, of the whole warping thing, but uh, that was it fun. was good enough for me. Yeah, I like the stuff me. behind me, yeah. actually. I was kind of surprised. Yeah. I was like, wow, how did they do that so well in 1987? Yeah. Really, really nice. Yeah, the, so the graphics and the, and the warp, uh, like... You know, seeing the wormholes as they were going by and all the galaxies yeah. kind of flashing by. I really enjoyed that. Reminded me of uh, the movie Contact uh, with Jodie right. Foster mm-hmm. when she mm-hmm. when she's going through that porthole. Um, so there were aspects of, and I also want to say that this guy who played Mister Kaczynski was was really good um, as far as being the era, you know, being arrogant and overbearing and you know self-important i thought yeah. he hit those notes as, as good as you can hit it from the second yeah. he walked in he didn't even have to say anything and you're automatically like what's this guy's problem absolutely right. <laughs> and you know that's not easy to do you know we know as actors right. you do a guest part you know the right. cast is cast is solid you're walking in and um, you're owning the place, you know, you're playing this kind of arrogant asshole and just yeah. you know, walking in like you own the place. And you got to You got to you got to be able to do that. You know, that's 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 a tough that's a tough gig. Mm-hmm. And, I also really um, liked yeah. the music scoring. Yeah. I don't know if it's the same person all, you know, for each episode, but I was really impressed, especially when Picard almost steps out of the turbo lift into whatever was going on out yeah. there. Yeah. Like the music mm-hmm. really grabbed me. And that was the first time I, I fully noticed it, although it was great throughout. But that's when I really uh, noticed it. Also, real quick, Michael Reeves. Uh, mm-hmm. I recognize that name. He's, a, he, you know, he's a writer. He's done a bunch of stuff. He also, I believe, won some things for doing the Batman animated series that kind of like blew up the world like 20 years ago. If you remember when the Batman animated series, I met the guy through our good buddy, uh, mm-hmm. Strzok, uh, Mark Zakri. Uh, who did Far Beyond the Stars. So shout out to Michael Reeves as well uh, there. Yeah. Lots of good mm. stuff. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Another um, that, female writer, Diane Duane. Right. That's our yeah. second one we're seeing now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe even third. Uh, there was DC Fontana, right. who's basically doing working on all of these. Diane Duane. And there was the lady in Code of Honor, I believe. So I think maybe that's the third. 
okay. one. I don't remember. I don't remember her name though. I don't remember her name That's offhand. Right. Uh, That's Ka- right. Catherine Powers. Yeah. Very yeah, nice. There we go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We'll tell you what, everybody. We've got to uh, take a quick break right now. We're going to come back in just a second with our friend Eric Menyuk. Uh, well, he will be our friend after this. And uh, <laughs> so everybody stick around and we'll be right back on the seventh rule. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule. Of course, Sirach Lofton and Denise Crosby are here. We are joined by very special guest, the legendary, the traveler himself, Eric Menyuk. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you, Ryan. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. Very quickly, we have the trivioids of the week. Commander Riker wants Counselor Troy to look these visitors over. Commander Argyle says Mr. Kaczynski's methods are meaningless. The Enterprise's velocity is off the scale. The Enterprise is on the far side of Triangulum, whatever the heck that means. Starfleet will receive the Enterprise's message in over 51 years. Space and time and thought aren't the separate things they appear to be. A Targ is on the bridge. Picard likes his tea nice and strong. Up until now, the Federation has been uninteresting. And Counselor Troy feels such an abundance of well-being on the ship. It feels like quite wonderful. All right. (laughs) Oh, wait, I, got, I got goosebumps. I got goosebumps. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Eric. We had a blast watching this episode, and we hope you're doing real well today. Thank you. I am. Thank you, Ryan. Mm-hmm. It's great yeah, to be here. I love seeing Denise. I've not seen her in forever. It's great uh, to see her. Uh, Sirach, I've never met you before, but it's really nice to meet you. So I'm psyched. Well, pleasure is mine. Um, Eric, when you first got this role, uh, what kind of background did they give you to the character, this Traveler character? <laughs> it was interesting because before I had the Traveler, I had been auditioning for Data, came down to Brent Spiner and me, and fortunately he got it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, at the time, I didn't think it was fortunate, but now, in retrospect, uh, looking at my life, <laughs> it's fortunate. Um, uh, and so, actually, this is one of the few times, very few times in my acting career that I didn't have to audition for a role. They called me up. They wanted me to play this role. And it was interesting because, you know, they sent me one an early version of the script, and it seemed like a very ethereal character. I really liked it a lot. And they were saying, yes, very heady. You know, he's, he's, he's not really familiar with the language, but he, you know, he's been he's the traveler. He's been around. So he's good at picking up languages and things like that. And I still remember the one thing that I went in and, oh, God, what is his name? Rob? Can you tell me Moro? Bowman. Rob, Rob Bowman. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Bob Bowman. He was one of the, he started out, this is before you know, X-Files, he was doing all that. Uh, he mm-hmm. was amazing. Uh, sat down with him. Uh, and we had a really long talk about what he wanted out of the character and you know, I was one of the many people in my career who said less is more. Um, uh, so, uh, and and we went through him. He's very in touch you know, with, uh, um, oh, God, this is old age. Michael, makeup guy. Westmore. Uh, oh, Westmore. Westmore. Yeah. <laughs> Famous guy. Uh, <laughs> so, we'll bleep that out. Famous uh, 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 makeup guy. Um, and we, there, it was a really collegial effort, you know, putting this character together. The one issue that I had with Michael was I thought he should, you know, he was very tall, thin at the time, I was a little thinner. Um, and uh, he should have these ethereal kind of fingers. I mean, I didn't care how many, but they give me this club hand with two of three stubby fingers. And of course, my first comment was how he's supposed to be at a keyboard. How is he yeah. supposed to type with three cubby, cubby, there, it's not a keyboard, all right? With his it's mind. Touch, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, it's a touch screen, so you do everything by touch. And I went, oh, okay, who oh, no. knew? Um, so that was it. That was fun getting into it, Sarah. It was. That was that was before there was a touch screen uh, technology. Know, now everybody's exactly used right. to touch screens, so it's like, what is he talking about? But right. this is That's before exactly that. Right. 
Yeah. Well, and you'll notice, you'll notice like Kaczynski really deliberately pushes down on buttons, you know, and other people, everybody does it in a different way. You know, there's some right. of us that are touching yeah. a bazillion things all the time. Some just <laughs> one, you know, because we have no reference point at this point, you know. It, it was early on, this was before any episode had aired. So uh, I don't know if you recall, Denise, way back when, I mean, everyone's kind of nervous because they didn't know that it was going to be the spectacular show that it was. You know, everyone was kind of, well, we'll see how this goes. You know, we don't know that. Absolutely. We had absolutely no sense. We were like in a, you know, just a, a, a tunnel, you know, had no idea. And again, and again, it wasn't, um, we weren't getting a lot of positive comments out in the you know when it was leaking uh the 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 word on the street was was pretty negative right and and it was filtering back to us in in ways you know obviously there wasn't the internet and god we're really (laughs) i i god i sound like you know prehistoric but um, yeah it's it's you know (laughs) there was no internet there were no cell phones there wasn't a touch screen we did everything manually oh my god so (laughs) you know it was we were getting these you know this this vibe that uh Oh, this is gonna suck. You know, this is just gonna suck. And it's you gotta you gotta keep you know clean of that, clear of that, and just do your work and keep your head down. That's right. And and I'll say this, you know, what was also really sweet, you know, about the first episode doing that is everyone in the cast, at least, was they they were really kind of interested and excited, and and there was this kind of feeling like we really want to do a good job because, as Denise says. It, it, there's a lot of attention out there, you know. Oh my gosh, they're remaking Star Trek. You know, this is this is the fans aren't going to like it because they're so locked into you know the original series, and you know there's mm-hmm. all this you know negative about, as she said, negative vibe that we were getting. And so it was, it, I think, it, in some sense, and each of you know better than I, they kind of brought the cast together, and yeah. you know, to to, to really want to make a good product. And and I will tell you. You know, at the time, um, I thought all TV series, all TV shows, I was fairly new at the point, and all TV shows were had that kind of feeling, and they don't. <laughs> Sound familiar, <laughs> Ciroc? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. Well, no, I learned that lesson myself after, subsequently, after the show. I learned that you're not going to find this group of people that have this kind of enthusiasm everywhere you go. You think it's a normal thing, but as you move on in the business, you find that some people don't care about the work that they're doing or they'll half-ass it or, you know, there's no extra, you know, emphasis on quality. So mm-hmm. yeah. um, that's one of the privileges of, of, of Star Trek is that the people, everybody involved there really have a high respect for the work that they do. You know? Absolutely. Cool. Yeah, and your fate. Sorry, I was just going to say, in Strzok, you're facing the same thing Denise and Eric were facing when Deep Space yeah. Nine started, which was just like, well, is this good? Is this going to work? And like the leak in, coming out, people were saying, this is not my Star Trek. It was right. like, yeah. uh, and, and then that creates an uncertainty that uh, that actually favors the studios, because what they do is they keep the production in a, in a sense of suspense, of uncertainty. And right. that makes that makes you not come back and renegotiate contracts or mm-hmm. whatever it is that you want to get more money. And so by keeping the cast and the the crew in that space where you're like, oh, we're going to get renewed or we're going to get picked up. We don't know. Maybe it, 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 the advantage goes to the studios because they they know it's going to go on. They know mm-hmm. oh, yes. this is, yeah. is going to be three, four, five, six, seven years of stuff. But they're not going to give you that much information because you're going to use it to, you know, tell your agent to renegotiate a contract. Um, but Eric, I, I, my question for you is about uh, your chemistry with um, Will Wheaton in this episode is really good. And what what did you do to develop that chemistry uh, beforehand, or did you do anything at all? Well, I, I'll tell you right now, the part of you know, certainly for me, but part of being an actor for me was playfulness. 
And Will Wheaton uh, at the time was very young um, and I was very immature, still am, some would say. <laughs> um, and so we did have, what was interesting is we had a, a really good bond on uh, the set um, and we had a lot of playfulness. You know, his uh, his whole, I think for the first, you know, uh, I would say a few days I was there, the challenge for him was getting a clothespin stuck to my uh, outfit because it was so tight and so it was like upholstery on a car. You couldn't stick a clothespin. Apparently, this was a thing he was doing. I don't know why. What? He was the he was the goof off on the set. I, 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 I would say kind. He could yeah, be. He, could he was be. quite creative and imaginative. You know, yeah. I, I know. I I I don't know if I've told you that. Um, you know, he had a school a schoolhouse. You know, he had his own trailer, but he had then a schoolhouse trailer, and right. um, it was. I went in it one day to just check it out and you know see him. It was fantastic. He had just. Clothes you know, pins everywhere. Yeah, yeah clothes <laughs> pins everywhere. You know, just just decorative and creative, imaginative space. He really turned it into you know this wonderful wacky world that was so uh, creative. And yeah, he was he was really fun. Was and and I will say, you know, at the time, um, you know, he used to he used to complain about you know, well, you know, I'm just a nerd uh, uh, having fun. And, you know, at the time, I felt the same way, that it was, you know, it was the meeting of the nerds, uh, so to speak. <laughs> and so, yeah, we did have, thank you for noticing that, Sarah. We did have really good chemistry. And, you know, over the years, I've reconnected with Will several times. It's been a while now. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, uh, we really did have a good chemistry on the set. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed working with him a lot. Well, and also, it, it's it's the first time yeah. in, this, in the show that you're getting a sense that somebody really gets the character of Wesley. They really are getting him. They appreciate him. Um, they want to nurture that. They want those around him to, to understand what he sees and be very careful and, and mindful of, you know, this, this soul, because this is a special one. And, you know, we're with that. That's finally being addressed and said for the first time, not just, you know, get off my ship, get off my bridge. You, you put that down, Wesley, turn around, get out of that chair. You're <laughs> no, there's no kid. You know, it, everybody's so hostile to him. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a joke about like, you know, uh, uh, anytime anyone has an entrance or forgets their line, all they have to do is say, shut up, Wesley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was a running that thing. was a running gag. Yeah. Like, oh shut yeah. up, Wesley. You know, <laughs> yeah. And then you hopefully get your line back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, and I and I wonder, you know, as I'm watching now, see, Eric, I haven't I'm watching these for the first time in 35 years with these guys. Wow. Which is really, really fun and cool. Mm. I mean, I haven't seen the show since they aired. Um I'm I'm wondering how much of the attitude of the cast, you know, portraying their roles on the ship towards Wesley, did that bleed out into the into the public domain? I would say that, I mean, I I, I know uh, you know, like I said, having spoken to Will outside of the show at that, those early years, it was tough for him. You know, yeah. basically. The fans were looking at him like, oh, you know, he's just this, you know, incredible guy who can save the ship and do all this stuff. And, you know, they just they didn't believe it. They thought, you know, the spoiled kid, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, they stuck, you know, the character for the actor, which sometimes happens. And I think yeah. you know, Bill got a lot of grief for that from the yeah, public. I, I, so, I understand he did. Yeah. And so that was tough. That was tough. And, you know, it was unfair mm -hmm. because, um, Certainly. you know. Sweet kid, it's very sweet kid. Very. Eric, Android. you seem to have a pretty good knowledge of of all this. It sounds like you may have watched uh, some episodes a little bit more recently. Have you? Than thirty five mm -hmm. years, I mean. <laughs> yeah, but it was more recent than thirty five years. <laughs> Not that recent. Uh, oh. I think actually, when when they remastered the DVDs, mm -hmm. they played like two episodes that were in movie theaters. 
And one of them was this episode. And I don't remember what the second one was. Um, so that was, I don't know how long ago. That was a few decades or a couple decades ago. Uh, mm-hmm. I went to the movie theater to see, you know, that episode. Uh, and mm-hmm. it was great because family on the East Coast got to go to movie theaters there and see the episode. So that was fun. Um, yeah, I have not, you know, uh, it, it's interesting when you get to be, you know, my youthful age, uh, you have, you, you can forget what you had for breakfast, but things that happened 40 years ago or 35 years ago, stick like glue, you know, and especially I'll tell you, especially, you know, this, because it really was a unique experience for me, you know, uh, uh even in the, in, within the acting world. You know, to be uh, on that set working with the cast uh, of people who are all phenomenal, as Sirach said, you you know, you feel like, oh, my gosh, is this what it's like all the time? And it's not. And it was really a unique experience. So I do have a very fond recollection Mm -hmm. uh, of doing that. And like I said, really phenomenal director. I mean, everything kind of came Mm -hmm. together for me in that one in that one episode. It was really nice. Yeah, I I, I want to do a little segue to uh, the director that you brought up now, uh, Rob Bowman, which uh, I'm looking back at his resume. It looks like he was an associate producer on the A Team prior hey. to his, uh, Star uh, Star Trek Next Generation, and then after the Next Generation, he's a producer on the X Files, which you mentioned as well. So. Looks like he's uh, left his mark in the in the world. Absolutely, sir. Now, what I'm not sure of because I think he was Rob Bowman Jr. So I don't know if the A team was his dad or was him. Ooh. I don't well, know. they got him credited. Really? Right. Oh, you're right. Oh, you. He was oh, quite I see young. What you mean. Yeah, yeah, he was he quite was young, young on that first episode. You know, he went on to okay. do a bunch of Next Gen. We really liked him. Yeah, yeah, the producers okay. really liked him and hired him a bunch. Well, if um, there's a senior and a junior, they really should just combine the credits, right? Isn't that? If they're going <laughs> to yeah, share the okay. same name, then they just... <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, because um, I think he would have been like five or something. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay. okay, all right. Uh, Erica, did you, have you done any conventions? Have you done Star Trek conventions? A lot. A lot of conventions, yes. Actually, more recently, just because I've been busy, I haven't uh, taken up all the offers. But also, I mean, I hate to say this next gen as now, and then there's DS9, as you know, there's Voyager, there's Enterprise, there's now there's the, all the new shows on CBS. You know, us, us old folk kind of get pushed down. You know, so I don't get invited a lot. What I do do a lot is the cruises, uh, not the big ones, the little ones, uh, yeah. because I really enjoy them and I've gotten to know the people who produce them. So uh, it's fun. That's fun. And you know, after 30 years, you know, now it's just, you know, I, I almost know everyone who's on the boat. I, I almost know everyone you know, <laughs> on this. And it's, you know, it's 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 like a, an unextended family. And that, I mean, I'll tell you, that is the amazing thing about Star Trek, unlike, you know, almost any other show. Because it was, or I think originally, the only conventions you had were Star Trek. You know, now you have Supernatural, you have all these other shows that have conventions. Star Trek was the original. So, um, yeah. Yeah. and it, it is it is really, I think, a unique experience to go out and see, you know, talk to fans about <laughs> what they see. and. Uh, be able to uh, joke with them and have fun with them. It's a lot of fun. Uh, the one comment I always get is, "You're not like your character at all." <laughs> like, you're when not, you were acting, you're not all seeing and, and magical, and yeah, exactly. work, you know, yeah. coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, speaking of that, though, Erica, we only have a couple minutes left already. Time's flying by on us, but I just got to ask you, since you were the runner-up to play Data. Um, was there, what was your particular thought process when you were playing data? Was there something you focused on? Was it some weird guy you used to know in high school? Did you focus on giving him like a little tick or what? Did you have some kind of thing that pushed you up the ranks and made you a top two data pick? 
Yeah, I. You know what? Honestly, it was acting. I was acting. Um, you know, for me. Um, uh, interestingly enough, you know, when I saw it, Brent did a wonderful job. When I saw it, it was similar. You know, my picture when I did it was very similar to what you know Brent ended up. I think that I had a little more. Uh, what's the word? A little more, uh, for lack of a better word, think of, if you think of someone who's a little bit on the spectrum, you know, on the autism spectrum, a little uncomfortable just in his own skin, uh, not really familiar with what it means to be human. And so playing with that uh, was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that a lot. And apparently I did an almost really good job. <laughs> you know. No, you did. I mean, it's hard I'm to sure get was- past. Pass yeah. all the hurdles to make it to the final two is, uh, is yeah. a difficult thing. Yeah, who knows uh, what these decisions are, you know? Yeah, mm-hmm. it does. Uh, At that level. Yeah. Now, Eric, you said you're a lawyer now. And I, I, my, my question for you is were you, did you already have your law degree when you were acting or did you go back? No, I, you know, I got to the point actually, uh, you know, I got married. My wife told me she was pregnant, and I said, "Okay, I've got to grow up in that career." Then the real, I mean, the impetus for me was there was a, a couple things that happened um, uh, work-wise in the acting world. I just finished a film, The Air Up There, with Kevin Bacon, and it was not a great experience for me. Um, I had uh, wanted to do this play that was being brought. I'd done it in Boston and Chicago. It was being brought to LA, and the producers had to hire someone else, or in after they did. And so uh, uh, when my wife told me she was pregnant, I said, all right, you know, this, the, the, the trouble with acting is, is, as Denise said, you don't know what, who's making decisions, you know, what person is just going, nah, nah, and that ends your career, or ends your job. It's not a meritocracy. There were so many phenomenally right. talented actors that I've met that, you know, couldn't get arrested, as they say, and right. so many not so great actors who you see on TV all the time. So I really was uh, made a decision at that point that I was looking for a job where if I worked hard and I did well, that somehow I would advance. Not to say there isn't politics and law either. There is, but it's not to the mm-hmm. extent that it is uh, in that career. So that was my decision. At the, um, I had given it a good So you run. went back to school. So you went, you went back to school and... Yeah, I went back to school. Uh, I think in uh, while well, I graduated in '98, I went to night school. I still, you know, good jobs during the day, acting jobs. I, I shot, you know, the Ellen Show. I remember there's Ellen. Mm-hmm. There's a bunch of shows I did actually while I was in law school. Um, uh, and then, you know, when I graduated, that was it. And it's interesting because you know I was, uh, you know, a fairly successful actor. And there had some great years and some really not great years. Um, and, you know, I remember the first year my wife said, you know, I, I never see you anymore. Uh, you're not even making as much money as you made as an actor. Why do you why did you do this? As time went on, like I said, though, you work hard and you do well. The career goes up. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, my God, you know, what is this? Am I ever going to work again? So, um, so it, you know, and there are times when I regret my decision, uh, but not often. Right. Oh. Beautiful. Well, what kind of uh, law do you uh, practice? This yeah, like, quick reference. Sorry, oh, first, what kind of law? I actually represent children with disabilities. Hmm. Um, I get them services from school district, special education law. It's called. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's it can be very rewarding. It can be very frustrating, but it's very rewarding. It's kind of wow, like what the traveler yeah. did. Yeah, you're still yeah. working with children. I That's take great. kids. <laughs> and you're advocating. And you're advocating yes, for their well being. The traveler yeah. lives on in, in our enough, world. Oddly enough, you're the first person that ever said that. And that is so true. That's why I make the big bucks, Eric. <laughs> I'm a brainiac. Oh my God. She's a brainiac. Yeah, brainiac. A- that's such yeah. a um that's so that was so obvious to me as you yeah. were explaining. I mean, I I you know, I um I have a son and he was needing some 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 aid uh in elementary school. And of course, there are so many things available, but you don't know what to ask for. 
And we have in, you know, in California, we have this, um, the, the fate, you know, a fair and, and free appropriate public, free appropriate education. public education that we're entitled. Ever, all of us are entitled to all of these services that nobody knows exists because you check your kid into school and no one tells you that you're not handed a book, a guide. Nope. And nope. we were lucky enough to actually hire an advocate to walk us through the system and get some things that really, really changed my kid's life. Yep. And there yep. was a point, there was a point that I was so invested in what I was seeing and going through with my own son that I thought, you know what? That I'm I'm gonna leave acting and I'm gonna become an advocate. Mm. Because it will change it can change someone's life. It does. It really does, Denise. And thank you. you you've inspired me even more. <laughs> oh, um, it's what you do is tremendous. I know firsthand. Yeah, it is. And it was, I mean, as you say, it's absolutely true. Is, you know, school districts, if anything, uh, almost want to hide those things because it costs them money. Uh, exactly. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it is. It is, you know, it's, and it, sometimes it's really. It gets my heart because oh, these yeah. are students who need the most help, and you know they're not being and, helped. And there's such a there's such a lack of, um, you know, it, like if you have extreme autism, there's a lot of services. If you have physical mm. real, real d- damage physically, you know, disabilities, um, um, uh, you know, real real physical things, there's a lot of services. If you're this kid that they can't quite get into a box. And you are scratching your head, pulling you know, your these are, these are arguments I've made in court, Denise. Exactly what you I, just said. Because I actually, my it. son has, it. has a learning. Sorry, are, no, I have no idea any of this stuff that ever existed. Yeah. I'm glad we're having this discussion. Yeah, and I'm actually thinking from the purpose, uh, from the perspective of somebody who's out there who may hear this that is uh, underprivileged or doesn't have access or the knowledge Mm -hmm. of what they're entitled to, what is something that they can do their own homework and investigate? What is the the thing to research? Yeah, any kind of Uh, website. Yeah. Here's what I would say. First of all, you know, just to keep back on what Denise said is my son had a learning disability. Looked like, you know, perfectly, you know, typical kid. Uh, you know, no problems, except he couldn't handle being in a classroom because, you know, he felt stupid because he wasn't getting it. It wasn't because he wasn't smart. It wasn't because of anything other than a learning disability. And she's absolutely right. For those kids, it's really hard. And the school districts, people will say, oh, they're just lazy or whatever. And then, uh, Sirach, to answer your question, you know, one thing I want to also say is because under the law, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDA, which is, he said, mm-hmm. provides that all students are able to free appropriate public education, um, uh, attorney's fees can be paid for. You know, if you have a case, you know, you should, I, I would say, you can go to the OAH website and there's a list of attorneys and any one of them, you know, of course, I'll say if you look me up, that's, that's definitely the best. Um, <laughs> there's a list of attorneys that practice in this area of law, and there are also, uh, as Denise said, there are you know non-attorney advocates who also do this, and mm-hmm. there are a lot of good ones. So, yeah, and yeah. even if even if you know all of that is not something that is is doable, you know, you you start with the the, the school that your your right. kid is at. If it's a public school, you ask for, you know, um a meeting, a um uh, a testing IEP. IEP, mm-hmm. an IEP. There you go. It's been so long <laughs> since I've done it. But you ask yeah. for an IEP, which my kid, you know, had, and you begin right. you're, you're entitled to that. You must have access to that. It's called an IEP. The school has to provide it and start that track. Wow. And you this is very important. Uh, that's yeah. really cool. I'm so glad that we went in that direction yeah. and that people yeah. could find out what a hero you are 
Eric, oh, this is so it's cool. It's a traveler in real life. That's right. Even yeah. more so. Uh, we do have to run, but thank you so much, yeah. Eric. Please give us the inf like online information that we can include in the description box below so we can add these websites. So anybody that needs that kind of help and doesn't know that these kind of things are out there for them and their children, uh, please check out this information. Can I mean, email it to you? I can yeah, email please. It to you. Please, and we'll, right. we'll include it in yeah. the box. Thank you. Really appreciate right. that. So everybody check that out. Yeah. Stick around, Eric. We're going to give a very special right. thanks to Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, Carmen, a.k.a. Skillet, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin. Arukin. Titus Muller, Darlena Marie, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Rex A. Wood, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Neil Akasaka, Justine Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, my live from Tokyo, Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, Henry Unger, Jed Thompson, Amy Renee Haynes, Sean Mouch, Marsha Classic Schreier, and of course, Dr. Susan V. Gruner. Thank you so much, Eric. This was so cool. Uh, everybody check out the information in the description box below. We really appreciate what you do in real life, Eric, even more so than you taking the time to join us today. Uh, My pleasure. Great. So everybody at home, stick around. We've got the free for all up next and we will be right back on the seventh rule. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule. This is the free for all. Of course, uh, Melissa is here. Justin and Marie, Eve England out in Wales, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Homer Freezy has decided to return to grace us with his presence. Stephanie Baker, Jed Thompson, my live in Tokyo, Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, Carrie Schwent, Tierney C. Diekman, and Faith Howell. It's going to be a party, everybody. Let's get it started quickly, right? CNC Music Factory. Mm -hmm. Melissa Longo, yeah. can, you, can you please get us started? <laughs> uh, you've got a great picture of the traveler behind. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sarah Clofton, a.k.a. Jake Sisko, guesses the IMDb score. Oh, um, I always forget. Uh, I would say it's about a 7.6. That's my guess. 7, Any other guesses? Okay, I'm going to say that I'm going on and giving it a 10 right now because it starts the whole traveler arc. And it's mm. just a cool thing that it starts in the beginning this early. And then we still hear about it in Picard. So she Just thinks on the internet 6.3. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Sirach Lofton. Wow. It is a 7.5. Good knowledge Whoa. of the internet. Good job. Good stuff. Nice. Getting close. Yeah. Wow. That's all right. So uh, all right, Melissa Longo, your thoughts? Well, the. I liked this episode a lot. And the biggest thing that stood out to me in this was Wesley and his curiosity. Um, for me, he represents Starfleet's ideology in mm. the purest sense. Um, he's a genius, but he's also a blank slate uh, and uninformed by prejudices and distrust. And he approaches the traveler with this wide-eyed curiosity of what he can learn from this being that is so different from himself. And then in his curiosity, he discovers a connection, a commonality, and an empathy that is unique from the others on board. And I do wish that they had explored this relationship a bit more, um, but they've planted uh, these seeds that potentially explore, explore something very interesting between these two people. And I also liked that um, Riker takes ownership of shooting Wesley down and yeah. not listening to him. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was pretty pretty awesome. Uh, a, few, a couple other things that stood out was the Klingon Targ. Um, <laughs> Tasha Yar, uh, <laughs> your scene is, is very small, but you're always so believable 
in your acting and, and it, it caught my attention again this time. Um, and also the traveler and the, the actor that played Kaczynski, he was so committed to mm -hmm. um, being a hard ass and, and so closed minded, totally opposite of Wesley, but he did it so phenomenally. So those are the things that I took away. <laughs> You know, it's funny when uh, Melissa said, I wish I had seen more of The Traveler and Wesley. We all kind of smirked a little bit, <laughs> a knowing smirk. Oh, really? Except Eve's like, why? What do you mean? You'll see. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Noor, how are you? Welcome. Calling in all the way from your office in Duke University. Uh, what do you think of this episode? So I enjoyed it too, and, and I won't echo Melissa's points, but I actually want to build on one point that she mentioned about Kaczynski. That one thing I thought was interesting is that um, he he kind of switched by the end of the episode because right at first mm -hmm. he was very, you know, kind of repulsive and gross and things like that. But then by the end he was actually very sweet and like had a big old genuine smile and was happy. But the question I was left with at the end of the episode is like, so what happens next with him? Because I mean, basically they said all his all his calculations were bunk. Yeah. Is he fired? Yep. What like what is he going to do now? I don't know. Oh. You know um, I'll be I'll just have one other quick thing I want to make sure Vales has time. Uh, I lo I love when uh aliens are not are have something else besides just forehead differences from humans. And mm -hmm. I love the the traveler's fat fingers. <laughs> it was like three fat and I was thinking like <laughs> that's going to be terrible on a keyboard. <laughs> yeah, or texting. <laughs> or texting. <laughs> <laughs> but that was really cool. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah. Good stuff. I actually made a whole bunch of uh mistakes when I was messaging someone this morning and I wanted to say, oh sorry, fat fingers. But I'm like, I don't have fat. I can't even blame it on that. But the traveler, the traveler can fingers. <laughs> uh Eve England out in Wales. Uh, how are you today wearing a radical Abyssinian kiosk maroon hoodie? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Um I have to confess, I was starting to uh, question my life choices after the last couple of episodes, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm pleased to say that I, should really, I really enjoyed this episode and, yeah, really echo what Melissa was just saying. I mean, for me, my main observation was that it just felt a, like a really authentic sci-fi episode, you know, taking it out of the context of being a, a Star Trek episode. It just had sort of all of the good elements that, you want to see in, in some sci-fi so you know particularly like you know the narrative where you have this you know alternate plane of existence and then you have the introduction of this um you know this advanced alien being and and how that all kind of comes together to serve to illustrate how you know how humanity and starfleet and everybody still has this arrogance and these shortcomings so i just think that's a really i, I like i like that sort of trope that you get in sci-fi and i thought that they play that really well then when when they have that conversation between the traveler and Picard when he said you know trying to you know what is the purpose of your journey he's like well there isn't though no, it, it's it's just for the love of of traveling and to to learn new things which and originally I was thinking oh that's a bit strange because that's exactly what their mission is all about is to go out there and explore new worlds and go where no one has gone before and that's this sort of episode just embodies all of that um, but it just kind of shows them that actually their idea of that you know they're still so they've got so much to learn and I thought that was just a really good concept to start with and then just just generally speaking I just thought the production of it was just beautiful the, mm. the scenes of the distant galaxy the one you've got there Ryan is it's just beautiful and I can just imagine that that's pretty improved since they've done the um, the enhancements mm. and things but then also I just love the music aspect of it there was so much variety it's a eclectic mix of different music and you had you know, I loved how they brought Mozart actually into it when they were referring to Wesley as this, you know, this this Mozart genius. But then how you then had all of the, you know, the synthesizers and then you had the sort of typical sci-fi um, sort of mystical music. And I just thought all of that just came together really well. And just one final point, I really did like that scene, the flashback scene with you, Denise. And I was kind of just getting sort of uh, Blade Runner vibes, but also with a bit of a mix of the Audrey Hepburn mm -hmm. breakfast at Tiffany scene at the end when Ooh. she's in the rain. I just thought it was kind of, I just, I thought it was a really beautiful scene, even though it's just obviously such a short part of it. I'd, I'd really like the aesthetics of that. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, the cat, right. The cat in mm -hmm. yeah. Tiffany's, yeah. 
Eve catches oh. stuff that go way over my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Speaking of way over my head, Justin Weir, a.k.a. Shag840, is here wearing his favorite seventh rule Ciroc Lofton shirt, <laughs> matching my yellow. Uh, yellow. Fun fact, everybody, Ciroc Lofton betrayed me earlier today. We were both <laughs> showed up wearing yellow. Yeah. And he changed his shirt. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it was so sad. Uh, anyway, Justin, but you hooked it up. How are I you? I got today? you, man. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. Um, I brought my uh, Voyager cup because this episode makes you think of Voyager. Yep. Um, but um, I'm not going to share any details about this episode. I'm going to share a quick story of what this episode makes me think of. Mm. It was a very special Star Trek time. When they started remastering uh, The Next Generation 10, 12 years ago, when they cost $80 a season when they came out, I was working at a local theater, seven theaters. I was a shift manager, and I was there when we went from old school projectors to digital. But they had Fathom events where they would show, you know, concerts or, you know, different special things that weren't movies. And they showed this episode on the big screen to promote season one of the next generation and mm. i got the poster at home i don't know where it's at but i got a poster of it and um also i was able to take in my blu-ray player after we were closed and i could just watch the next generation on blu-ray with my friends in an empty movie theater and that's mm. really made me fall in love with tng and those are some great times amazing oh, i think awesome. i see a captain picard figure in your background too yeah he's on, he's on top of the enterprise <laughs> 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 the only way to travel That's uh, right. <laughs> all right good stuff dr Anne marie seagull is here she rides the same way except on a pickup truck uh, so weird um yeah so i would say first of all i just love wesley's sweater game <laughs> all the time. and i just oh to be able to like go through his closet um and in addition, I like, I, like Eve said, I just love the Mozart reference. And this is one of the beginnings of like this amazing classical music, um, the classical music, like weaving through the whole series. And I'm just such a big classical music fan. So it makes me very happy. And then thirdly, I just love the, I love the first time I saw this, I was like, who is this Kaczynski character? And like, <laughs> And you just want to know the backstory of like, was, did the traveler go somewhere and was like, okay, I'm looking for a mark, somebody who's like really a big blowhard that I could just like use and he won't even question in anything I'm doing. And I just love the idea that he went shopping for somebody like this. Uh, and I would love to see that backstory. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's like, this guy is perfect. Uh, <laughs> <It's> intolerable. <laughs> He's perfect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Out of the uh, Traveler and Kaczynski, Homer Frizzell is obviously Kaczynski. How are you, Homer? I'm sorry. I thought the Traveler. I meant. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna edit that out and just say Homer Frizzell is definitely the Traveler. All right, Actually, there we go. We were cosplaying at the next convention. <laughs> I'll be so I'll the be shirt. Kaczynski. The shirt I'm wearing is sort of inspired by the Traveler, as far as the the color palette goes. Um, but I, I thought your lead-in was that I was intolerable like Kosinski. <laughs> uh, so what I have on this one, it's I, I, just two things that stuck with me. One, that second time that they travel through space and time, well, however many millions, billions uh, far away, and the like data, I think, says something about maybe we should uh, you know, look around a little bit, maybe do some sciencing here. And Picard's like, no, no, there are other ships that are better equipped. And so uh, I think we should just get home and, you know, not even run a scan. Let's go. And I was really surprised that uh, Picard decided, I'm just going to turn around. I understand where he's coming from. He wants to get his people home. But um, e- even Janeway would check out the occasional nebula or something. And she had 75 years to go. So anyway. That surprised me. Uh, the other thing that struck me was just um, they, they just not to bring up Voyager too much, but uh, the EAMH and his bedside manner. I think he's got nothing on Picard. You know, he's very much like wake him, revive him. He could die, revive him. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like whoa, okay. And then the guy wakes up. Do you know who I am? It's like okay, all right. So. 
that's what I have for this episode. Thank you. I'm getting back up to speed. Uh, over and out. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent shirt. <laughs> Beautiful. Excellent work. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Baker is also here with a million dollar smile. How are you today, Stephanie? Good. I have new earrings today nice. that That's I good. got. Uh, I don't usually buy many things, but I, they're for the cruise. I'm going on the cruise for my very nice. first Star Trek cruise. I'm excited. So oh. I got some stuff. And um, I uh, really like this episode because I love Wesley and it brings Wesley uh, kind of out of the boy phase, calling him boy to giving him his name and Wesley standing up for himself. And then Mike Goo couldn't be here, but he had Mm. a great thought uh, regarding Voyager. We bought a lot of us have talked about Voyager is since they passed warp 10, why aren't they all salamanders? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> somebody called Tom Harris. yeah and then um and then i was a little confused at the end when they made him an acting ensign and um then then in prodigy there's warrant officers and then in other star trek there's field commissions mm-hmm. and just wondering what all the differences are and i didn't i didn't i don't quite understand if they if that matters but I still don't understand that even after watching decades of Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody know the answer to that? Larry's been looking for questions to write about in this month's Star Trek magazine. Perfect. So, yeah. Well, I would think um, like the fact that he's an acting ensign means that he's not gone through any sort of training or anything like that. Like a, a like a battlefield commission or whatever is, you know, that's right. like say you go from you're a commander and now you're a captain you've obviously gone through starfleet academy you're within the ranks of that and then a, a warrant officer those are the, your nco that's just somebody who signs up but they still have gone through some basic training so in this okay. case wesley has not gone through any sort of basic training but picard's giving him this it's basically when you get an honorary degree from a university but you've never gone to that university or whatever you know it's mm-hmm. it's a name only but giving him the opportunity to then start training and then work towards that Mm -hmm. but then in the end picard says the seat is they talk about it being for commissioned officers is an acting ensign a commissioned officer we all look to matt (laughs) (laughs) i would would feel commissioned yeah he still he still doesn't have a commission but but by him you know i'm sure there's some sort of loophole that allows by him having that the unofficial title that does allow them to give him those privileges. That's just my guess. I don't know. I could be talking out of my nose. So who knows? It's okay. Who knows? That's it. Uh, great stuff. Thanks for the education, Matt. Mr. Jed Thompson is here. By the way, we had a poll within uh, just us. The question was, who would you cosplay? Cosplay Kaczynski or The Traveler? And nine of you said The Traveler Five brave people said Kaczynski. <laughs> he had that little extra thing here. Did you see that? Yeah. He didn't. Um, yeah, something different. So uh, how are you, Jed? What do you think of this episode? I'm I'm doing well. Thank you. I I enjoyed it. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to start with that. I I enjoyed it. Um it was interesting uh the you know the, you had your sci-fi and techno babble, you know, you've got decent dialogue, you've got sound setting the foundation for future plot lines. Uh and we get to see Boy Wonder come out, you know, and be Wesley uh and start to be Wesley as we know and love him. Um, mm-hmm. there are a couple of little details that I'm going to go into because I think everybody else has said a lot of the great salient points here. And a couple of the little details that I absolutely loved, um, was just one of the lines from Picard was yes, but isn't the real point. Can you do it again? Can you get us home? You know, it's just like, that's like, oh my God, we're so far away. And, but can you do it again? Please. Like that's that leader. Like, no, come on, bring it, bring it back. And then, you know, real quick, on a very small detail, and and it's 1987, and, um, you know, during these visions the crew is having, you know, you see a, one of the, the crew members, uh, you know, is a ballerina, and 
she's African American. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. Mm. And I think that, you know, I am not African American for anybody who's listening to this oh. and uh, or a person of color. And I think that seeing this, you know, because I think of Misty Copeland, who's yes. at, uh, I think, the American Theater. American yeah. ballet, ballet. Uh, and, it's the, and it's the prima donna there and so I think that was just wonderful to see and an example a small example of mm -hmm. the progressiveness of Trek in general so and that's mm -hmm. that's my story excellent mm -hmm. great that. stuff fantastic uh also wearing a really cool shirt by the way that I didn't notice at first it's a oh, chat yes. pack shirt oh yeah. Yeah. beautiful from the teespring store uh -huh. yeah everybody my is guess what live in tokyo how are you today my you've got something special prepared for us today right yeah uh, we'll see how that goes yeah um <laughs> the, this this episode this is this was my kind of sci-fi i love it there's a little connection to what we know a little speculation about what we don't know and what that might be um a lot of assumption that puts us right into the story um and then when they do that just it all feels as real as the nose on our face it's incredible I, I really liked it great character development interaction boom we're back baby i love this one um that said when at right at the beginning when picard is talking about why the test asking about why the, the tests are being conducted or riker's asking about that and then and then he sends riker to receive the visitors he was very emotional not eliciting or leader like he was um his demeanor was much more like a defensive teenager i thought um, but then this changed dramatically during the episode. And, and as it's as if he went through a light speed amount of character development as well, because at the end, you know, as, as people have mentioned, he was incredible. So that was good. I love the relationship between, uh, the traveler and Wesley, the graphics on this one, the, the ship going straight and then going around the curve. I thought, eh, if it's going through a, a wormhole, wouldn't it be compressing and then expanding? Uh, I, I don't know. It just seemed a little bit weird to me, but. I, I, I loved everything about the episode. Um, the one thing I would say, though, is that it's this isn't the first time that the traveler uh, has revealed that, that that species has revealed themselves in the previous decade uh, around 1975. I think it was there was as it was actually a a, um, a reveal of the of the, um, the species. And I, I dug through the archives and I found. Um, Found an audio clip of the announcement when they revealed themselves, um, and it goes a little something like this. Oh no, we still can't hear it. Yeah, we can't hear it. What a tease! Oh, doing that thing where it cancels. Oh episode. wait, oh wait, hang on. Here, here you go. Now you can hear it. Yep. I'm a traveler. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Okay, wait, wait, it has to go off before we get copyright busted. Yeah, good save. Good save. I know I started counting too. <laughs> less, than 10, less than 10 seconds, and it's two pieces of clips that are both less than 10 seconds. Amazing. I figured we'd be Amazing. under the wire. Amazing. Beautiful. Excellent work. Anyways, Thank you, Mike. That's mine. all I've got for you guys. All right, nice. let's move on. Get it? Led on. Uh, <laughs> hey, that's uh, amazing. <laughs> Carrie Schwent is up next. How are you, Carrie? What's your favorite Led Zeppelin song? Um, probably <clears throat> that one. I think Eric's more of a Led Zeppelin fan than I than I am, but that's okay. But I actually have a slight different musical connection to the episode. Watching it, watching the episode made me think of the. There's a a line in the in a track from an AJ, AJR AJR song called "Next Up Forever," and it, it goes, "This is my imagination. This is how it looks and sounds." And that's sort of in that third place that they, that mm -hmm. other place that they get to with all the you know thoughts becoming real. Just had that had that song playing in my head, and that's sort of what the T-shirt that I've got is from AJR concert. That kind of a similar thing. You got all kinds of crazy instruments and yeah instruments cool. in that. I had a lot of fun making making the the limerick for this one. Eric loves it, and I hope you guys will too. So here it goes. The traveler helps with a test to make the engines better than best. People see what they think, but it's gone in a blink. In Wesley's future, Picard will invest. Kind of enjoy that. Yeah, Wesley absolutely shines in this episode. I agree with Anne-Marie. I want all of his sweaters. They just look so... <laughs> 
comfortable and I enjoyed the hell out of, in particular about the, the the end scene where Picard and Riker are just having a little bit of fun at Wesley's expense before saying, Oh yeah, we're good. Let's just give him a commission. That way he can stay, stay on the bridge. And they want to call, um, they want to, Riker wants to call Dr. Crusher up to the bridge and Picard responds with, why is anybody up here sick? She doesn't need to come, come up here. That's good. He wants to just stay and look around. He'll, t- he'll, he'll tell his mom later. And I have a little, story for the for the the bonus segment about argyle the the scottish engineer and if scott jensen was here he would have absolutely recognized recognize him from from gilmore girls hmm. yeah i love that I, his, his voice is fantastic but i will i will end with the quality eye roll from troy <laughs> when they when they go to when she says oh can when Riker says can troy come down and and meet this guy with me. I want to give him her, give him the you know, empathetic one, once once over. Huge eye roll. Them stalking up to the turbo lift. I wanted to see to have her. I wanted to see her let him have it in that turbo lift. That mm-hmm. would have been just an absolutely fun scene. But that that's where I'll end. I've got a couple other things, but we'll save that for excellent for the, for the bonus. Stay tuned for that, everybody. Did you guys notice that really cool line, or I thought it was cool, when uh, Riker and Troy were talking and, and uh, Troy said she was concerned about the the guy, what's going on, and, and Riker says, good, stay concerned, please. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really yeah. well written. Yeah, smart. I had written that, that line, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, good stuff. Thanks, Carrie. Dr. Susan V. Gruner is out in Starfleet Academy. How are you today? Mm-hmm. I'm good. Thanks for asking. Uh, I actually really liked this episode. I felt, I can remember watching it, that now they're starting to get into character development. Mm. It's a a little weird to me that they started with Wesley, but I always love Wesley. And uh, here is this young, brilliant man who... uh, he is a blank slate. I thought that whoever said that, that was perfect. Was it Eve? That was awesome. He is <laughs> full of empathy. He's kind. He's brilliant. And I thought, what a great human he is. And I love that Riker at the end acknowledges that Wesley was right. Wesley notices things that nobody else notices. And I love that about him. So this is, for me, the beginning of when I started liking uh, the next generation better because I thought, wow, there's going to, we're going to start to learn a little bit more about the characters. I think Picard is still a little bit uh, on the rough. uh, He's still rough here, but yeah, uh, having Beverly uh, wake up the guy who could, who could have died, but uh, he gets better too. But yeah, loved it. Love (laughs) Wesley's sweaters too. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> all right great stuff one of these days we should all wear a wesley sweater <laughs> yes we dare. and Those i'm wondering so too how, how come everybody else isn't wearing a sweater Are, is he cold <laughs> <laughs> no our suits our suits were quite warm trust me oh no <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna get a belt and high heels and a clutch and wear those out on ebay <laughs> So Ditto. Ditto. Uh, <laughs> Tierney C. Diekman, a.k.a. the Borg Queen, is here. How are you today, Tierney? Did you love Wesley's sweater choice, sweater game today? And what did you think of this episode? Absolutely love all of those sweaters. They are amazing. They look so comfy. And yeah, I, mean, I think we each need to have a Wesley sweater day. Uh, <laughs> yes. We <I really laughs> love this episode. Always have. Um and I agree, echo a lot of comments. Um, <laughs> card. Um, Kaczynski is just, my God, we could, we, we'll go on about Kaczynski. But um, one point, the, <laughs> I wish they had kind of done it, but uh, probably for the show, it's better that they didn't. The original teleplay for this was absolutely wild. Um, the Enterprise explodes 
out of a cosmological egg in that births a new universe and uh, the Enterprise has been missing for six days from our local group. And on the seventh day, Picard issues a day of rest. But, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. A la Genesis. Um, so that would have been great. But uh, uh, d- disregarding some of the wacky science uh, leeway they took with this one, um, one, I mean, a lot of things that I really love about this is even with the watering down of the script, there is just fantastical exploration. They go two galaxies out and we get these amazing effects. Uh, and then they are thrown to the edge of, of the universe with this great character, the absolutely delightful, lovable traveler. And he's amazing. I mean, he is both physiolog- physiologically and technologically advanced uh, in a way which he explains his abilities to be a, a focusing lens, which I, in more armchair logic, I guess, would consider it allows him to control the observer effect that we have as humans in quantum mechanics. And that kind of brings it more into a realistic prospect of theoretical imaginings um, in our own real world. The, the things we love to apply to uh, to Star Trek. Um, so I guess I, I would like. I, I wish there was a little bit more information on him. Does he does he steer the elemental wave functions of the universe? Um, you know. I, I I would just I, I would like a little bit more on that, but I just I love this episode. I love the traveler. I I love his character. I just wanted more. I wanted more wildness, um, less rape gangs. But <laughs> it, it's just it's I've always loved this episode, and this feels like the first one that we're really getting into real Trek, real TNG Trek. Uh, so. Some some points that are not so great, but others that are that are wonderful, very enjoyable, great sweaters. <laughs> Sirak and uh, Denise noticed the uh, rape gang mentioned for like I think what is what is it thirty five times in five episodes that they've mentioned. <laughs> yeah. See if it tapers off <laughs> and the, see if they have anything forgot. else to work the with. The outfit that they put you in, Denise, and yeah. all. Of that. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Like, is it necessary it, it, at this point? Ah. Not it's, after five um, episodes. You know, and, and it's weird that we're talking about this too right now. They they keep talking about the rape gangs. You know, wh- why didn't they show like Tasha kick their asses? You know, because she escaped mm-hmm. them. She never, you know, she she doesn't talk. There's never mention of her getting raped. Mm-hmm. She's always escaping mm-hmm. the rape gangs. So mm-hmm. if you want to like really empower Yep. her you know see how she she gets out of it you know mm-hmm. not with that with the kitty mm-hmm. cat run kitty cat run you know it's like they're not yeah, after the cat you want you want this yeah. come and get it fuckers i'll kill you you know like <laughs> get, like just eviscerate them mm-hmm. yeah. yeah you know but they never they never it's just tantalizing you know they're always they're always just hinting and sexualizing and, you know, objectifying. And it's um, like we said, I don't I don't remember what comes next. I don't think we're not going to see any more rape gang or, you know, slinky outfits. But we're going to where is this headed? I'm not, I, because I can't remember after 35 mm-hmm. years, you know, I'm seeing this for the first time as well. So mm-hmm. it's interesting now to be at this point in my life looking back, going, aha, interesting what they did here. Well, you know, Denise, I did have Catwoman vibes when I saw you in that black leather outfit, though. <laughs> the, the black, oh, yeah, it was kind of a black leathery vinyl yeah. thing. Yeah, very, yeah. with the cat, 
It went to Canada. I, thought, I got you some know? Michelle Pfeiffer vibes. It was, you know, but, <laughs> yeah. but at least you yeah. saw her, you know, get some action, you know, right. <laughs> just like, that's what I was always saying. Like, why don't you let Tasha be the security chief and do yeah. get, give, her, give her some action. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That would have been a great turning point. If at one point we do get to see, her beating them up or, you know, winning yeah. the battle or whatever. And then there's like right. this moment where she's like, okay, I think I'm, I know where I'm going. I think I can do this. I think, and that kind of turns her life into that direction of, right. You know, it connects the control. dots. Mm-hmm. It connects Absolutely. the dots. She obviously has talent and strength in that right. area. Mm-hmm. You can see that she's a survivor in that scene. There's, there are claw, there, you know, there's scars, yeah. you know, that makeup was applied. And I know, I noticed that. Really? And, and that added, it was such a short scene, but that added mm-hmm. depth yeah. to the character. Um, was that the cat, yeah, though, that did that? It, that was Freddy Krueger, I think. It was pretty, I mean, I no, pretty major. <laughs> yeah, because it was like five, you know, it looks like yeah. cat scratches. And I'm thinking, why are you, okay, she's been an orphan since she was five on right. this Tricana four and she's in, this is the outfit she gets into, you know, I mean, what it, it just, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking she would be in like total combat survival gear, you know, that would make sense for, for weather and for climate and for, you know, survival. This looks like I'm going to, you know, studio 54. <sighs> <laughs> all right know. well speaking of studio 54 we've got <laughs> faith howell on the enterprise d bridge <laughs> parting it up like a savage how are you today faith <laughs> um yeah good um i really um i feel like this is the first episode so far this season where i really started to get that yeah this is my comfortable trek this has, you know, the space element. It has the science. Um, you know, love, I love me some rock talk. So, I'll, you know, reference her for a second. But <laughs> um, definitely, um, I think you guys hit all my big points. Um, I love the sweaters. I definitely was going, hold up now. So we hit warp 10. Why are we not all lizards? I feel like <laughs> there was something miss- missing here. There's some continuity missing. I know that's like, what, 20 years in the future or something, but... Anyway, so um, I, I giggled at that a little bit. Um, yeah, but uh, overall, it was it was a fun watch, and um, I'm hoping for more more of this kind of fun episode. Oh, speaking forward. of continuity, Faith, I thought of uh, when <clears throat> Picard had the seed with his mom. I was thinking in the new mm-hmm. Picard series, yep. his mom dies young, right? But <laughs> because what was going on was sort of their wishful thinking, I feel like you could justify that into maybe he had thought in his mind that this is what she would look like had she lived. And so right. I, I think you can kind of force those puzzle pieces together. It definitely, you know, to. you're losing a little <laughs> elbow grease in there for sure. Yeah. But, but I, I think, did like I think the scene with them. I thought the scene yeah. was very touching and emotional. It's, and It's not like um, this uncle Cisco's that, got lost somewhere in the story <laughs> if you guys remember those we had those early early on cisco had some brothers and a sister or something hmm. we never hear mm-hmm. of after what season three? Oh, the sister yeah yeah mm-hmm. so and and joseph cisco was dead according to one scene so i don't yeah, know I'm gonna let the him first on, on card on the <laughs> yeah all right uh Great stuff. Thank you, Faith. Chris McGee is here, ready to drop some knowledge bombs on us. How are you, Chris? Oh, I'm going to save some of those knowledge bombs for the after party. But nice. I don't know, know what <laughs> else I can say. Well, that hasn't already been said. We can save that for the... Uh, it gives you a reason to uh, check out the uh, things I've done said later. So, I will mention that I did like uh, when Riker introduced Argyle as one of our chief engineers, which... I, Absolutely makes sense since he got rid yeah. of the last one, McDougal. You know, so here's the next one. I'm sure he's going to be around for a long time. Uh, I, I, I will also mention that I'm sure that the special effects cost a fortune when they were made back in 1987, uh, and they were gorgeous then. But they're even more beautiful now with the higher resolutions and HD. I can't wait till 
we see this in uh, you know 4K HDR with wide color gamut, and I hope we don't have to wait 30 more years for that. Um, and lastly, I'll mention, uh, did you, Ryan, did you happen to notice any NAMs in this episode? Oh, let me check. I don't think so, actually. Mentions. Let's hear it. Non-appearance ma- mentioned by Chris McGee. When they re- reach Galaxy N33, Data mentions a protostar forming. So the oh. protostar, mm-hmm. that counts, oh. right? Heck, you know, yeah. that is so clever. We got to count it, right? Oh, Sorry, what do you think? Oh, from <laughs> Prodigy. I had it in my notes. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, <laughs> That's good. That's good. Well, and like, the last thing I'll say is the, in a way the too phrase long. of the episode. My favorite, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite phrase of the episode is such dangerous nonsense. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, which, which is a non-appearance mention for no we can't do that all right because then if we mentioned an actual show that would be terrible uh matt boardman <laughs> is here how are you today matt everybody did you know matt boardman's an amazing graphic artist how are you hey how's it going <laughs> um just to uh just to kind of piggyback on what chris said there it's you know, it's actually pretty amazing once they did the, you know, I, you know, grew up watching Next Gen and it was very mushy because of that transfer over to uh, tape. But now that they they went through and they digitally scanned uh, the footage, yeah, those models are absolutely beautiful. Um, and, and we're getting to see details on them that we hadn't seen before. So that was always super impressive, including when I worked on uh, season two, we had to paint out a Band-Aid that had fallen on the Enterprise and somebody had just painted over. So, um, yeah, so you got to see details that you wouldn't normally see. But, uh, no, this is a fun episode. Um, I, uh, you know, there's there's not much more I could say that, that hasn't been said about it, but I, I really like the moment uh, when Picard sees his mom. And if you remember in that, you know, we obviously they've kind of retconned that a little bit in Picard season two, but he says in, in that episode of season two of Picard, where he says, I always would picture my mom as what she would look like when she was older. And like that kind of made this, and even watching it through this time made this, that moment between the two of them even more uh, poignant, you know, more spe- special to me. Um, and there was even, and this is kind of, I haven't caught this before, but there's that moment when Riker walks up to him after he sees his mom and he's just standing there and he has this very mom- uh, vulnerable moment at the time. And it, and then quickly he's like, oh, wait, I'm the captain. I have, you know, I have this persona I have to, but you can see, I mean, there's almost a tear in Patrick's eye at that moment. It was mm-hmm. so well played, mm-hmm. so touching yeah. um, that yeah. I really loved it. And then, of course, you know, I, I love, 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 love the, the the journey of Wesley. And I just think it's great that, you know, now we get, you know, this is kind of one more that this is that launching point as he's made that acting ensign. Yeah. At least we didn't have to wait like five seasons for that, right? At least they're like, <laughs> episode five, give them what they want. <laughs> uh, well, great stuff. Uh, Sirak, any uh, final thoughts, Denise, before we run off? I was it was the actress that played Mama. She's Greta Ware, right? Uh, I don't know, Srock. Do you have that pulled up? Let me check. She she oh. is a was a formidable formidable actress. Yeah, Herta and, Ware. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, yes, that's what her name is. Um, mm-hmm. I'm trying to think. I think she. I think she has um, worked with some really major uh, European directors. If I'm, if I'm, I don't have my phone here in front of me to pull up anything, but um, I just remember how impressed, I mean, we were really excited to have her as a guest star on that episode. She carried Mm. such, such weight, you know, once in a while you'd have these guest stars that, um, uh, would come on and um, you would go, whoa, really? And she was she was one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I like that scene. Actually, reminded yes. me the the way that was backlit. Um, her her shots were backlit. Reminded mm-hmm. me of the two thousand one Space Odyssey 
at the end of the movie when he's seeing himself in the future and in the past and the way they lit that scene similar wasn't to, she uh, in the second the second 2001 the next one wasn't didn't she play the mother 2010. yes was yes, she, she in was. that movie she was wow. in she played yeah. the mother yeah oh wow yeah yep so it's funny because the light her hair was being of, brushed of, by the invisible yeah. person hmm. Hmm. so yeah that's crazy that that reminded me of that movie um that scene with uh, her in captain picard wow but i thought this i, I thought it was uh one thing i wanted to mention was when the one officer was caught behind the wall of flame in this episode that Officer was Dennis Madelone, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, no way. Oh, yeah. That's so cool. Sirac so catches Dennis every single time. Every time. Whether he's a cool guy. He's such a cool he's guy. guy. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. I had a lot of good times with him. I had a lot of good times with him. And so I was like, oh, Dennis made his appearance, his first uh, <laughs> appearance on screen in this episode. The other thing that stood out to me, I guess I didn't notice it before, but there was a small scene where they kind of cut to the Starfleet skirt on one of oh, the uh, yeah. officers yeah. back there. And I was like, oh, I didn't really pay attention to that uh, fashion right. design. Mm -hmm. It didn't Scant. really carry on into Deep Space Nine. It didn't, didn't make it to our show, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> uh, it, doesn't go, it doesn't go that much further on this one. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. heard uh, Avery Brooks was fighting hard to keep them, though, no? Yeah, no. I no. know. But it's funny because... <laughs> I do see people cosplay as that yeah. when I go to oh, conventions, yeah. and now mm -hmm. I finally know where it comes from. Aww. Oh, that's that's where that cosplay comes from. <laughs> um, I do like the spinoff of this uh, show, uh, the Kaczynski Method. I thought that was a very good spinoff. Um, <laughs> and since we were talking about Battlefield commissions, I felt like we have to bring up the commish, Michael Chiklis. In honor of Aaron Eisenberg, so I I throw that in. There. <laughs> you made Homer smile for the first time all day. It just happened. Good <laughs> work. Beautiful. <laughs> all right, everybody, uh, we got to roll out. Did we say welcome back, Homer? Welcome back, Homer. Yeah. Uh, Yay! Thank you, Melissa, <laughs> Muhammad, Eve, Doctor Anne Marie, Justin, Homer, Doctor Stephanie, Jed, my Doctor Susan, Chris. Carrie, Tierney, Faith, and Matt uh, for myself and Denise Crosby, Sirach Loft, and Aaron Eisenberg. Thank you all so much. We will see you next time. And until then, always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>